Hi, I'm Sue Ann Rochester. I'm the managing director of Wild Child Animation, uh, and I also run the Scottish cohort of animation, uh, Animated Women UK. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you today to this final event in the CMC Friday webinar season. Since they started in April, they've covered topics such as kids' attitudes to lockdown, their changing media habits, broadcasters and social media responses to the crisis, what freelancers need to know, what the SVODs are up to, and a fascinating commissioner conversation with Cheryl Taylor at the BBC. On average, there have been over 150 people participating, participating in each one, and I can reveal that today we have 75 people participating already. You're all very welcome. Let's start with a big thank you to all the patron sponsors who are backing these CMC webinars. They're all on screen now. So we have Akamar Films, Azumi, BBC Children's, CITV, Daryl McQueen, NBC Universal, The Elf Factory and Zodiac Kids. And this session is, speci is specifically sponsored and appropriately enough by Ardman. Ardman is an independent and multi-award winning studio. It produces feature films, series, advertising, games and interactive entertainment. The studio's work includes the creation of much loved characters, including Wallace and Gromit, Shaun the Sheep and Morph. So a big thank you to them too. They're also going to sponsor a session at the CMC online, which starts on 6th of July, along with a couple of dozen other companies who are helping keep CMC alive and kicking. More of the plans for that at the end of today's webinar. So today's event has been produced by Beth Parker and exec produced by Marion Edwards, one of the deputy chairs of the CMC advisory committee. This webinar will be recorded in full and uploaded to the CMC YouTube channel by Sunday evening. And we want your questions and observations today. Send them along as they occur to you. The only way to send those is by using the Q&A button. You can see it here. Don't send questions using Zoom email because no one is reading them. Okay, so on to the event. We have spent a little over three months living in circumstances none of us have ever experienced before. The animation industry appears to have adapted relatively well to the situation, which could be read as a sign to us all that think that it is perhaps time to change the way we work. So rather than talk about how we're going to return to the pre-March 2020 normal, we want to use today's session to talk about what we might be able to learn from working in lockdown and how these learnings might improve our future working practices. For example, should we be looking at flexible working for everybody so that those with children, those caring for sick or aging relatives, people with disabilities, or simply those who don't live in the animation hub cities, can get work in the industry and are able to stay working. What disadvantages does work, uh, flexible working present? How do we strike a balance and not, not exclude anybody who isn't necessarily able to work from home or perhaps those who need to learn from the traditional working environment? To help us have this discussion, we have four panelists with us today. Corinne Couper from Team Two in Paris, who is also president of LFA our animated women partners in France, Ollie Hyatt from Blue Zoo, Rory Lowe from Wild Child, and Evgenia Golubeva, who is a freelance writer, illustrator, and animation director. I'm going to ask each to briefly introduce themselves and answer the question, how did you adapt to life in lockdown? Okay, so let's start with Corinne. Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. <laughs> So um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I am the co-founder and executive producer at Tinto. Tinto, uh, perhaps we can see some slides that I brought. Uh, Tinto is one of the largest independent CG studios in France with offices in Paris and Balance. Tinto is, uh, we can see uh, the next uh, three images. Tinto is a creator of several award-winning uh, original series like uh, Angelo Goose, Mighty Mike, My Night and Me. Perhaps you can show some images. Yeah, so next, uh, next uh, two images. And as well, the feature film Yellow Bird. And if, I, if we can see also the next images, we are also working with a number of uh, great partners. 
So the next images will show you, we are working with uh, Disney, E1, Silvergate, Netflix, to name a few, and on shows like PJ Mask. And recently we are working on creature cases and City of Ghosts. Um, so uh, perhaps um, we are out of the image now. And uh, so I am also the co-founder uh, and co-president of Les Femmes Animes, the association dedicated to women empowerment in French animation, as well as a board member of the French Producers Association. So you can see the next image. During lockdown, in fact, I was a very lucky mother, stuck in a large house with a garden with my three adult kids, plus one of their girlfriends, and my husband, who did the cooking for everyone, plus my cat. And uh, on the work side, our entire studio, 300 people, had already been working from home since even the mandatory lockdown. You can see now a, a small video that we prepared with the, some image of the, the teams working from home. So in order not to become too disconnected from each other, we try to focus on keeping the team spirit. So in addition to uh, the production meetings, we were organizing all days. We organized online group breakfast each Friday, for example, which were recordings and uh, we were keeping then the contact as much as we could, sharing news about the studio, the achievement of the different teams, new projects, and also asking people about their own challenges. And we will see, and they had a lot. And we did also, and we can now skip to uh, an image, we can, uh, we can show we did also a newsletter that we created during the lockdown. Um, and uh, all these ex uh, uh, ideas were very well uh, received. Uh, you can see on the newsletter, we were talking about the updates of the studio also, and news and stories from the team members. And uh, they were all talking about their lockdown experience, some part particular funny stories. And uh, we added some games and uh, funny stuff as well. So that's it. Well, this is my lockdown story. Oh, that's fantastic. Everyone looks so happy. <laughs> um, let's move on to yeah. <laughs> Ollie. <laughs> so Ollie, how did you adapt to life in lockdown? Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so I um, personally live in a similar situation. I live an hour outside London uh, and have a house with a garden and fields I can walk into. Um, I equally have children. Sadly, mine aren't grown up. So I've been doing the homeschooling thing, uh, which I realized I'd be an amazing teacher for about six weeks. And then after that, I would give up uh, and slowly wish someone else would do it. Um, so that's me personally. The studio, um, we are a very similar size. We're about 250 uh, people. Uh, we've actually grown over lockdown to about 230, uh, sorry, to, to, to nearly 300, um, which is interesting recruiting where you can't actually meet anyone. That's a, a big challenge. But uh, again, similarly, we uh, saw the lockdown coming and we started the process probably a week before we were officially allowed. Uh, and within two weeks, we had everyone at home and they were working to about 80% capacity. Uh, capacity issues were caused by uh, internet equipment, which we managed to sort out quickly. And then again, people like myself who were doing childcare, that's where uh, the problem has still remained. Um, you know, and even though one of uh, mine is, is back at school now, it's, it's different times and it's still, it's almost just as awkward. So uh, there's a bit of capacity dropout because of parents, um, but we're trying to plug that by employing some more people. Um, technical issues haven't been too bad. Mental health issues were more important. We've made sure there's been a lot more mental health uh, provision available. We've tried to keep all our physical clubs. We did while we worked Blue Zoo running um, over, over the period uh, of lockdown. So things like clay club or uh, modeling clubs, uh, life drawing, running clubs. We've tried to keep those going as best we can. And two, we just upped our communication. I mean, that's the important thing, isn't it? We've upped our communication. I think, I think I meet and know more people from work now, having been locked down, than I did when I was actually at work. So that's one interesting upside. But that's really how we're coping. Uh, and it will feed in a lot to what we do when we're allowed to go back 
H1. Excellent. Great. Thanks, Ali. Um, so, Evgenia? Hello. Uh, yeah, so my name is Evgenia and I'm a freelance writer, animation director, illustrator, and um, uh, I've been working from home for a while now, for about seven years, and I used to be based in London, uh, but I moved to stratford upon avon quite a few years ago uh, to start my family, and uh, I was... Um, and to be honest, uh, my life in the lockdown didn't change much, <laughs> apart from a couple of challenges, obviously, because um, at the moment I'm working with Disney and they've been very accommodating of my changed circumstances with homeschooling. And uh, I'm supervising productions of two TV shows. One is uh, uh, the both my ideas and uh, one, the team is based in Lisbon. And I was meant to go to Lisbon, but obviously didn't. And another one, the team is based in Russia. But because we already had uh, the whole pipeline set up beforehand for, uh, because I'm obviously based here, so we were ready to face it. And like, as Ole say, said, it is tricky with childcare. Like the childcare was the biggest issue, but luckily my husband is a writer, he works from home. So we just divided our schedules the way that it worked for both of us, so we both of us could work. And... Um, and also uh, voice recordings were the hardest because obviously we're in production, so we need to record actors. But luckily actors all adapted very quickly and bought the right equipment and provided us with lovely, um, so we did like Skype recordings. <laughs> it's hilarious. Oh, and um, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks Evgenia. Um, so Rory. Hi there, yeah, um, Rory Lowe from Wild Child Animation. Um, so Wild Child is a coming together of Wansall Farmers and Red Kite in Scotland and about 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, uh, when my, we were still part of Wansall Farmers, I moved south about 400 miles away from our studio in Scotland. So I, I've been working kind of on remote working for quite a while and working through the kind of pros and cons of that. Um, a lot of the things that Ollie mentioned are relevant for the studio. We've been doing some of that. We were getting tools in place beforehand, um, partly because of my working situation, partly just work, working with lots of freelancers. So we had that set up. So that has been implemented really well. And that's working well, getting everyone working from home. Um, but yeah, part of my moving away was about having a family. And I think that's one of the interesting things about this coming out of the positives as well as the negatives. It's like the whole conversation about childcare in the workplace now seems like a much more open conversation. It feels like we can talk about that and we can say, all right, well, you know, we're busy this afternoon because we've got to deal with childcare. Um, yeah, I do the teaching. I, I second the thing of, I would be a rubbish teacher. I'd probably be a good teacher for about five minutes. Uh, teaching is a very hard thing. Um, yeah, and it seems the animation seems the perfect uh, situation for this kind of working because animators generally quite insular folk and quite happy to work remotely. Um, so yeah, it's for us, it seems to be working well. It's about w what are the best forms of communication when working remotely? How do, you, how do you generate, which I think we'll come on to later, how do you generate those room situations? Because one-on-one, -on -one, you know, that works really well. I think that's me. Excellent, thank you, everybody. All right, so let's move on to our first question. Um, it could be said that one of the barriers into the industry is a socioeconomic one. It is harder for poor kids to get into the arts. We have also all experienced working on shows where the producers insist everyone works in house, often because of network security requirements. This shuts, shuts out all, all sorts of people with responsibilities at home, as well as those with disabilities. Is that going to change, do you think? Could remote working help those who find it hard to get into or stay into the business, or is it just another barrier? Corinne, would you like to answer this one? Yeah, I, I think uh, I was amazed by the way the, the way our teams worked out the change very efficiently, efficiently. Sorry, everyone was very focused on the way on the fact that they needed to work, but at the same time, I'm not sure this very strong energy would survive uh, on the long term. So. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like a studio is not just a group of employees. A studio is a group of people working around, a captain, a director, a lead. And I think that people need to be uh, inspired by one another. So uh, for, especially for the youngest, being together, to me, allows a better opportunity to get into the group and be integrated. So it seems that 
this kind of uh, remote working brings more difficulties uh, to, to, to be included in, uh, in, in teams. So, uh, and in addition to it, there is a very unfair disadvantage for some people because of their personal uh, organization, the different housing, the Wi-Fi uh, connection. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, it's... Uh, it's good to see that it could be working, but I'm not, I'm not seeing it at a, as a long form way to organize the work uh, from now on, 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 my, on my side. Um, Oli, Oli, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the whole thing has given us a kick up the bum, to be honest. Um, and I would add to that, you know, while we're thinking about how we work and who we work with, I'd add in um, the the, everything that's going on around the Black Black Lives Matter um, and how how we treat people fairly. I think there's a there's a whole kind of um, shift it feels in the time that we've been out of the office about how we can do things. I would certainly hope that people could see more opportunities in animation. We've been talking about it for years, but not doing much. Um, we've we've uh, had remote the possibility of remote working for ages. And when we've talked about it before with maybe like four or five or six people, we've always been like, oh gosh, it's so difficult and they won't be in the room or whatever. And isn't it funny, it takes us if, to get everyone out of the room, to get everyone back in the room in a way. It's a, it's, a, it's a really strange situation. But I would say the problem starts before, whether you're in the office or out of the office, the problem starts before then. And it's about um, education and the opportunity of education and, um, children believing in the fact they can go on to have these careers or indeed that animation is a career because for many years in, including myself there wasn't much of an industry in the UK so I wouldn't have advised people to take up animation now the opposite is true and it's how do we get into those schools how do we make sure that everyone understands it's an opportunity for everybody and it really is with animation you can it doesn't matter what you look like what your disability ability um, race creed whatever it doesn't matter you can get into this industry and there's more and more good organizations we will try to help in the bills net there's all sorts of people now putting in a, a big focus on that so whether it whether it's uh, because of lockdown or because of whatever i think everyone is having a rethink and the industry will be all the better for it yeah i completely agree um rory yeah i, I second all of that um i think there are times where people have come into us um so socioeconomic and geographic two things that have forgotten as well as yeah all those ele elements kind of gender and race and all those things we've had people in who are hugely talented and weren't getting a look in just because of their accent that was in particular you know work in class areas in Glasgow and giving them their start and then they go on to have incredible careers um, and I think geographic is huge it, obviously there are the issues of, um, of internet connection um, education is huge, but then people are able to educate themselves and, and do amazing courses online. There are people who can get themselves to quite a high level from remote locations. If they can then work from that, then that does open up. I think that opens up a whole new area and fields exactly without having to move to a hub, without having then the expense of living in the middle of the city or moving away from parents or whatever it might be. So yeah, I think it opens up a lot. Excellent. And Daniel, what do you think? I've been working remotely for a while now and I've been working with teams based all over the world and to be honest of course there are challenges when you when I'm doing production and I'm a director and I can't see my animators physically in the same space it uh, does put some problems but at the same time I found that because we are all so passionate about our jobs actually people still are very passionate they do their best to deliver and actually I to be honest I didn't have many problems at all and I think it definitely opens up because I come from working class background and from single mom family and uh, I did uh, when I told my parents that I'm going to become work in animation they were like what <laughs> and uh, and I think it does open up all kind of opportunities because uh, obviously it's nice to be based in London being able to go to studios but it's great to be based somewhere else and uh, have a nice family lifestyle where you can fit your children in and uh, and have a career as well. So I think it's definitely something that I would like to see more of, like more opportunities for remote work. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so next question. Um, given that young people coming into the business learn so much about the working environment by osmosis, learning and developing their skills from observing those more experienced members of the crew, how do you ensure they don't miss out on that experience if everyone is working remotely from time to time? 
Uh, let's start with Ollie this time. Yeah, it's a really good question because I, I just wrote down actually the looking over the shoulder thing, the just being in the environment and being able to ask a quick question. Um, we all know that you can uh, try and phone someone on Zoom or send them a text, but it's not it's not as uh, creative and it's not such a coherent approach as being able to just look over their shoulder and then spin something around in Maya and show you a technique. Um, having said that, um, again, I think it's given everyone a kick up the bottom to make the delivery of online courses and online learning so, so much better. And things before that people thought you couldn't teach online um, have happened or were better in a studio environment. Um, some examples of that, you know, Anim, Anim Dojo, we've been running that uh, to help uh, boost animators um, when they've come out of uni or, or before then to get up to industry standard. We've been running that successfully for about three years. And it's just about adjusting that to try and include more people or help, help more people. Um, but, but across, every, I've seen innovation in every sector, and you know, across, across the creative industries and others as well. And I, I just think um, we can get much better at it, but I still think there's a place, there really will always be a place for having somebody working near you. And hopefully very soon we'll be allowed to do that again. It's not the end of the road for that sort of thing, I don't think. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Evgenia? Well, when I started uh, writing, I guess it, because I do a lot of writing, for me, it's actually quite nice to be at home and think, like have time to think about things. And I used to work in house when I was animating in London. And uh, I found that sometimes quite, um, I was a junior, obviously, starting out. And uh, it's true. It's, it's great to be able to talk to your colleagues and uh, sort things out quickly. But at the same time, I'm, I'm sure you can make both. So you can do both. You can kind of do... Um, go in the studio sometimes and work from home. I think it would be nice to have flexibility uh, and uh, because then it could make it a bit easier as well. Yeah. Uh, Rory? Yeah, I think it's probably the single is the biggest challenge of the whole thing. There are technical issues and, and other things to work around, but it does seem like the, the most important thing to be face to face with. And yeah, there's so many kind of subtleties around that. It's, a, it's basically an old fashioned kind of apprenticeship system, isn't it? Where people learn off the experience kind of masters around them and that's really key so yeah I think at the moment I think that's the most difficult bit to get right and absolutely in the future we can come to that later on but how we balance working remotely with working back in the studio at a later date that will be a really key part of it but yeah training up newcomers is a challenge I think at the moment mm, yeah uh Corinne? Yeah, I think that uh, even if people are working remotely, they need to come sometimes and then they need to know the studio to, to which they belong, they, be, they belong, sorry. Uh, they need to feel the energy, the creativity, they need to know their, their partners, their, their colleagues. I think there is a cross-pollination and uh, I think that there will be a balance. Of course, people will keep working from their home perhaps in the future, but they need to come and there, there need to be a, a studio. We, we can't go to a totally remote situation where studios are somewhere. So, uh, yeah. Excellent. Um, okay, uh, next question. Uh, animation production is a very collaborative process. A lot of people talk about the benefits of being able to knock ideas about with other people in the room, the benefit of working in a creative environment, etc. As someone who works a lot from home, how do you stay motivated and stay creative in isolation? Um, so if Genya, that's probably best for you to start with. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's been quite challenging, I must say, and um, because uh, usually, like without obviously in lockdown in place, I, I travel to see the studios, and I go to London, I go to Manchester, I go to Bristol to see people who I work with, and even go to Lisbon, and and it does create a very nice energy. You actually get to know people better, you know, the expectations, you kind of find a way to work together, and. And I really miss this part of my job because now it's um, it's more like I'm just sitting me on my own <laughs> sitting here sending ideas there. So it's it is quite hard in isolation. So I think definitely I would say that it's important to see people and have this uh, writers' rooms and when you can sit down together and um, come up with ideas together, brainstorm. And I'm quite lucky because I have a lot of friends working in animation and animation directors, writers, and I can have a chat with them anytime I need to. 
and uh, my husband is a writer so it's uh, we work in partnership sometimes and it's also very helpful because you can just kind of come up with ideas together and uh, and actually for me actually a very big part of my job is going to conferences like cmc is going to festivals film festivals and uh, i think the only reason i make short films is only so i can go to film festivals and see people <laughs> yeah i mean i yeah i think the human connection <laughs> is everything isn't it yeah um, and motivation wise i guess um uh, because I, I love my job and uh, I, don't, I don't struggle with motivation at all. Uh, I struggle with motivation to stop working probably. Like I, I really struggle to <laughs> stop and like forget about work. And uh, Because I, I have a sketchbook with me all the time coming up with ideas and writing down, like sketching some little things because I just, uh, I guess in animation, we're so lucky because it's, it is a lot, it's like part of my personality. It's not just a job I forget about when the five o'clock is or like six o'clock but uh, it's more it's it's a huge part of my who i am so uh, and uh, lots of people i work with they all the same they're all very passionate about it and uh, very motivated which is great excellent that almost should have been another question like how do you separate work when you're working <laughs> from home how do you switch off at five o'clock because it's very hard um, it is. Sorry, uh, how yeah. do you stay motivated? And well, creative? on that, it's like there are some positives with it as well. I, I'm absolutely terrible for having lunch at the computer, still working all the way through lunch, and that's one of the positives in lockdown. I think I actually occasionally go and have a lunch break and go and sit outside and try and find some actual separation from work, but it doesn't help with the working in the evening and just yeah, working at other times. Um, in terms of the, the original question, though, yeah, I think it's. I think there's probably a multi-prong approach and it, it'll change in the future because part of it will be technology. It's one of the parts that doesn't work particularly well or doesn't work as well. Like big group meetings, we're used to seeing 16 people or whatever. We develop the etiquette for that. How do you speak? How do you chip in? How It's really hard to have those kind of casual side conversations in there. So possibly there's technology that will help that in the future as virtual meetings get better and stuff like that. But for me, so when I first um, moved away from the studio and say I'm, I'm visiting every similar every couple of weeks, something like that, and going to projects and there's nothing like being in the room with people, but to recreate that a certain amount, then I found, I, to start with, I was actually working from out of home, out of our office, which we're all doing now. But I did find that that became too much cabin fever after a while. I think I survived about two or three years like that and then just found a local office. So as well as, as you say, it's kind of your peers and your friends and other creatives around you that you're bouncing things off and in whatever format. I think if this was a more long-term thing, so people, again, if people working remotely and geographically opening up opportunities to people, if you can create local hubs that aren't necessarily just your business, but you still have other creative people or just people to bounce ideas around, I think there's something really interesting in that in the future. And again, those things, I've been looking a bit into this for the last few years, those things generally only tend to exist in big cities or in re regeneration areas and stuff. So I think a bit more kind of focus on local community. And again, it's one of the positives of this. People are getting involved in their local communities, aren't they helping out the elderly or people who can't leave their houses? If we can bring that into the creative sphere as well, there could be something really interesting in that, I think. Excellent, Corinne. Um, I agree with everything that was uh, that, that was said. Uh, integrating uh, new people is uh, is uh, a new opportunity. I still think that uh, we need to have uh, uh, a studio and uh, and uh, open our minds to to different kind of uh, new way to to work. So I have no new things to add here. Okay, thanks, Ollie. Anything? Yeah, I think um, it, it's a blessing and a curse as well, because while it is great to bounce ideas around people, I think all of those ideas that we've had stored up in our head, um, we've been given more time because we're not traveling to work. So, you know, it takes two hours out of my day. Some of us, some people have been furloughed. I was speaking to Nina Hahn from Nickelodeon um, this week, and she was saying she's seen more creative input and more, more output and more um, out there ideas because people just have the time to play with stuff they get to see a different viewpoint you know I've spent a lot of time with my children I see how they play and things they do and that inspires me and so the, the time and the different environment can't be overrated but eventually 
that will become our norm environment and we'll need some other environment and other people to spark off. But I think the time has been a, a, a blessing for, for creatives and, and writers. And I, fin I finished a book. So like not reading, I can read. I mean, I finished right. So everyone says I got books, so I, I finished it. So it's like, I, th I think, um, I think it, at the moment it's still slightly a novelty, but I think a, a blend of the two eventually will be what works best for me and probably most creatives. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Okay, um, last question. Uh, do you ever worry you might be slacking when working from home? Or to those running studios, is that ever a concern? Uh, let's ask the homeworkers first. How do you stay on track? This might be a sweeping statement, but creatives are notoriously disorganized. How do you prevent your production managers from worrying you might not hit your deadlines on time if they can't see physically, if they can't physically see you working? So let's start with Rory. I think it, actually the part of the answer to the last one I think is true. The, the sweeping statement is true, which basically isn't it? We are generally quite disorganized people. Um, but you find, yeah, that's how you find your rhythm in, in that approach. In that sense, I haven't found it any harder in lockdown. Um, I've, I, yeah, I guess I see that from both sides when you're looking for feedback from other people. And so I've been doing that for a longer period of time. It does come down to trust but you, you have to trust people initially and then you find out quite quickly if they don't do it. I think it comes down to that. If you're expecting a week's worth or a day's worth of work, whatever it is, and that's not there, then you learn who you can work with remotely quite quickly. And maybe it's a slightly different set of skills, although probably those skills are very similar to, you know, it's all important of how you fit into a studio as personality and how you can trust people. And, you know, th those elements are the same, just I guess in a slightly different way. Um, but as I was saying, I think animation in particular, people are quite autonomous, aren't they? And quite introverted, like to be able to just get on with their things. And you've got kind of key, as long as you've got those key feedback sessions in there, then um, yeah, I don't see it. Again, I don't see it as a problem. Obviously problems arise, but those are problems arise in the studio as well. And you'd be dealing with those in a similar way, I think. Uh, Corinne? Yeah, I like this question. I totally agree. We 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 had this issue at the beginning and uh, what i can say is that our managers they learned about trust as you said and uh, they learned that uh, it's no need to check when and how people are working because uh, they are delivering and uh, and it changed totally the way to to see this and uh, of course in france we we are supposed to it's the, it's legal we are not uh, authorized to work uh, and pay people by task we are obliged to pay them monthly and there is no issue. I mean, it worked very well. Trust was the new world and uh, the results were there whenever the, the people were working and it was very challenging for them. I mean, of course, we said it, they managed to work, to have the, the kids' lessons and uh, everything, but uh, it worked. And uh, the people really earned our admiration at that time. Uh, Kenya? Oh, well, um, as I said, because I guess um, it's, um, it's my passion, I, I don't really, I, I, like, I struggle to stop working. I think this is, for me, the biggest problem. And actually having children, it makes it easier to be more organized because your day is already naturally organized when they go to school. So you have this time or they come back after, after school clubs. And uh, so obviously, and... Um, uh, and I've been working with different teams as well. And uh, I found that some people do slug and some people don't deliver when they said they're going to deliver. And I just don't work with them anymore because I just can't afford to <laughs> chase them and uh, listen to the excuses. But mo but to be honest, it's only like 2% of people I work with. And, uh, and, and in writing, usually you have deadlines and it's great to have deadlines. I think it's very important to have a structure to your work. And, uh, and sometimes some projects like especially development and I do a lot of development. I help people to write Bibles for the shows, pilot scripts. And uh, sometimes they don't give you a deadline. And uh, it is tricky then because you, you like keep working on the projects that have deadline and you, <laughs> so, but uh, so I think the structure is very important and calls like uh, weekly calls to uh, ch check uh, how is everyone doing is great because then you have this little uh, extra kick to stay on track. And uh, when I'm working in production, I usually have like to-do lists uh, given me uh, to me by my producers and every day I have a to-do list. And again, I need to make sure like I stay on track. So I think there are lots of 
ways of managing it and uh, uh, and it's definitely uh, and I wouldn't say I'm disorganized at all uh, I think being freelance because you need to pay the bills obviously you need to make sure your time works while and you can't just <laughs> you know not work so actually it's it's pretty easy for me uh, Ollie yeah, I think um, I think it's the same same thing as always running a studio. So it's about the environment you create um, and the culture you push out through the teams. Um, and once you've got that right, uh, I think everything else um, becomes easier. Um, th I think the part of that that's become harder is the communicating of the of of those two things and the communi the creative communication between the teams. But I think. Um, I think if you've set that up right already, even remote working, um, that just comes through. And I happen to be a big believer in um, distractions being good. I think, especially creatively, I think if you were never distracted, it's like the, the creative brain. If you're always heading down a straight linear path, then I think you tell the same stories. If things are distracting you and you're taking time to look against the time thing, taking time to look left and right and see other ideas, my children are naked in the garden now that's distracting me uh, they're in a sprinkler um but uh, <laughs> the, yeah I, th I think it's good to take sideward glances all the time uh, and then it's up to your really good producers and your line managers to make sure that those distractions don't turn into deadline slipping so i think it can be a positive thing as well as a negative thing oh uh, it's fascinating i think i think we could go on all day uh, on this subject and i think it is going to evolve quite a lot over the next com coming months uh, so thank you for that uh, before we go into the q a um i just want to ask one quick question to each of you uh what will your new normal look like so really quickly rory uh it's a combination of for me and for the studio i guess uh, it's the combination of working i think it will involve both working from remotely and working in a studio I think you can't get away from, as been mentioned several times there, the heart of what you get and the creativity of people coming together. And I think that will be really vital going forward. Um, but the flexibility that it brings in, the fact that that opens it up to more people, the, yeah, how your, your work-life balance and work family with relation to work, all of that, I think there are opportunities working remotely as well. So yeah, I think it will be an interesting balance of the two going forward. And that will be the question. Kenya? Uh, for me, I guess uh, I might uh, try and do less traveling because I've been doing a lot of traveling the last uh, five years and uh, it does take a lot of time from actually working. And, uh, and also sometimes quite a lot of meetings could be done via Skype really. And uh, I think uh, the next time I will just like make sure that the meeting is worth it. And uh, sometimes it's, it's easier to do it remotely. And uh, I do miss festivals, uh, going to film festivals. And um, but actually, I enjoyed watching films online. Like I, uh, I watched uh, films on Stuttgart Animation Film Festival and Annecy. And I think it's a great opportunity for people who can't go every year uh, to actually join the conversation about short films, look at work in progress from the houses. I think it's it's very important, especially if you have families, if you have like school holidays to think about. It's great that you can just sit in the evening and watch some films. I hope I hope film festivals will keep this option because I would definitely uh, do uh, do it. Uh, Karin. Yeah, same for us. Uh, we, we are now a little bit uh, coming back to the studio. We are like uh, a third of the studio coming back uh, for the whole summer and we will see how it goes uh, in September. I'm so happy to be at the studio today. <laughs> it feels so weird uh, to be back. So uh, yeah, very happy to, to, to introduce it uh, sometimes to come and, uh, and see uh, and see the colleagues around. So. And will you go in every day at the moment now, Corinne? Sorry, sorry? Will you, will you go in every day now? No, I think that I will keep coming uh, twice a week. So do my, some of my colleagues. So uh, we will organize the summer like that. Excellent. I'm envious. We're still in our houses. <laughs> um, Ollie? Yeah, I think that... Um... Buck, buck, I'm on a call. Sorry, I knew it would happen. And he is still naked. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think um, we're, we're taking a, a, I guess a similar approach, but it might be slightly, we've, we've just asked everyone, like, where do you want to be? How do you want to work? How do you work best? Where do you see yourself 
in two years, not in and how you work, like physical space. Are you going to be in London? Are you saying for family moving out? So we've done a survey of where people want to be. And incidentally, all animators want to work somewhere beginning with B. That's the, uh, whether it's international, most answers begin with B. So uh, if you say for an animation studio, go somewhere with B. Um, and those might look like little pods of eight people. Um, where they're in that studio, out that studio a bit. Maybe it's not just animators. Maybe it's a more like holistic, artistic environment. I don't know, but we're going to try and set up hubs. We'll always have the London base. Some people may always work from home. Um, so we're just asking people, what, what do you want? Where do you want to be? And, and, and hopefully we'll find somewhere like the right answer to that. I think that's like the perfect way to approach it, isn't it? Take it on an individual basis and if anyone's like Evgenia, uh, then obviously working from home is no bother and you'd be no concern to any employer. So I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's exciting times ahead. Did, did everyone answer that? Well, uh, uh, yes, excellent. Um, okay, uh, so we've got questions. Um, let me have a look at those. We've got quite a few questions, so. Um, we're going to start with Olivia Dixon. Um, so Olivia said, uh, I noticed that Corrine and Evgenia mentioned that their partners were up, so what their partners were up to and how that helped with being at home. Ollie and Rory mentioned their parts in homeschooling and Rory mentioned how conversations about childcare have changed. How do you think the learnings from this period will affect the status of women, particularly after having children? And how will it help younger people, men and women, who are considering starting families? Um, oh, who wants to start this one? Uh, I was kind of my point at the beginning. I think it does help. So my partner's a key worker. Um, so we're juggling, yeah, except both of us trying to work whilst doing schooling and, and she's less flexible. So, you know, it creates difficulties. But I think, the, again, the positive to come from it is at least that conversation is open. So that conversation is open for men and women. Um, and, and all can say, well, I have family issues. I have, we have to work around that. And now that's acceptable. And I think, I think that's universal. And it will be a good thing that that's universal and it's fully acceptable for people to go, no, I can't do that because I have childcare issues. I think that does open it up. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I, I, agree, I agree. I think it's, um, it's very good that at the moment it's much easier and uh, um, like we do 50-50 and we've done 50-50 with my husband since our daughter was born and if uh, I go to film festival for a week, it means he can go for film festival another week or we made sure it's, it stays equal and it doesn't affect our uh, career opportunities. It doesn't stop us from developing further from uh, from doing courses, from going places, uh, because it, it's very easy to kind of, uh, I think it's a very good question because it's also, it's great that uh, now it's for fathers and mothers. So it's not just mothers uh, who should take care of children, you know, it's, it's for all of us. And I think it's great that uh, we can actually make it work. And I hope it's gonna be more and more common in the future as well. Yeah, we, we all hope, but I think that uh, what we heard and what we saw around us is that it was particularly difficult for women uh, in the studio. And uh, even if we are, we all have nice partners, but uh, here, but uh, in what I, what I saw is that uh, mothers were really uh, very, very uh, heavily uh, uh, charged. And uh, they were the ones that uh, were uh, you know, uh, giving courses and, uh, to the kids and uh, cooking, etc. I think. I mean, I'm not doing a study, but uh, what I saw around me was uh, really difficult for uh, for the women in the studio, the young women especially. I mean, the ones that had young kids and. Uh, Sometimes it's linked. I mean, the ones that are younger have young kids and small apartments. So all together, it makes life very difficult for them. Um, I would just uh, add to that that I think, I think it's um, really particular to what age you are and where you are in the world and 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 how your setup is as, as to how it's worked for for anyone, let alone whether you're a, a woman or a man. But I think, um, you know. I, I think it's down. I think it can change. All of this should be used as a yardstick to review, review everything. What I hope it doesn't do, because I, I know in our studio, let's say 12 years ago, I, we were heavily 
male dominated and then we made like a big conscious effort just because you know we don't it wasn't a, that nice an environment we made a big con conscious effort to shift and it's very evident within the studio the environment got nicer um the more sort of uh, multicultural and all different ideas and it, it was just much better i hope because we can't physically see everyone that it doesn't doesn't affect that and if you can't see you, you don't have a you know you're not representing everyone i, ho I hope that it doesn't take away from that in a way but but yeah i think i think do you know what everything's up for grabs isn't it and i hope we all use it as an opportunity to to make everything easier for everyone yeah absolutely um so next question is from ian wilson uh, from Argyle. Um, I, I'm an animation graduate. I became a father and full-time carer to my wife before I had the opportunity to gain work experience. I've turned down a job offer in the past because of my situation. How can I work from home for a studio if I don't have industry experience? This is a great question. Um, who wants to start with this one, Rory? Maybe? Yeah, that's a really tough one, isn't it? How do you get that experience? I guess it's, um, as we're saying about training people up, because it's the, it's the kind of fairly vital part of getting into a studio. It's creating opportunities in the current situation. So I guess it's, there's no time that's better than at the moment and seeing if you can get test projects and test things to work on. But it is tough because the experience is the most, you know, it's the most key bit. Basically, it's the catch-22 of coming out of college, isn't it? And trying to get that first piece of in, um, industry experience to get to get into work. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Is the answer to that? It's a really really tough one. Oh. Um, what about you, Ollie? Because uh, I mean, you must be hiring lots of graduates. You've got lots of projects on the go at the moment. So how does it work at the moment for you guys? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think the recruitment process um, up until the point where they physically come in the studio is exactly the same. You apply. You apply through the same channels. I think um, I think there is, and obviously it's hard to comment on an individual case. I think there are ways now where if you if you're getting rejected a lot based on the reel you're sending in and your CV, there are little things you can do to help up upskill yourself. And I'm going to mention Adam Dojo again because we've had many examples of people who've come out of colleges colleges. Uh, companies have said you're not ready to come and work for us even as a even as a junior which is a fault with the education system right but um, by doing anim dojo which is a monthly you know it's not a huge cost like your universities by doing that paying a small amount of money and upskilling yourself you then could come out with um, a showreel that will get your foot in the door or just having been on some of these courses uh, and there's a lot of free courses out right now which is brilliant because of the situation we're in a lot of people have been very generous with their time and very generous with what they'll teach you slightly upskilling yourself and being able to say i did the anim dojo course um, you might get spotted there on those courses because they usually have lots of heads of studios and to uh, big top animators so if you do good work and they see it they may be able to we we've certainly employed people who have been through that process with us so there are opportunities now that there weren't before. Um, but yes, it, it's going to be the, it's the perennial question of how do you get an opportunity to show you can do better when you're not, you're not getting that opportunity. It's really, it, it's really tricky, but all you can do is try and do it yourself, improve yourself, learn more, keep trying to put your foot in the door and, and show people your skills. Uh, anything else anyone wants to add to that? That's pretty comprehensive. Excellent. Thanks, Ollie. Um, so I think we have time for more questions. So Alex Washington asked, uh, where do you feel the breakdown of communication is between aspiring animators and studios? Both want each other, but seem to never connect. Who wants to tackle this? Oh, he's smiling. Shall I kick okay. off? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a, a bugbear of mine because, um, uh, years and years ago so i know i know you can't believe i'm this old but like 20 years ago when we set up the studio um there were lots of animators around we didn't have the tax credit then we got the tax credit and there were lots of jobs and all of a sudden university courses all over the country started popping up doing animation the quality of those courses in many cases is not high enough that when they come out they can get offered a basic position so i think almost the problem isn't um the graduates aren't able to engage with companies because we do need people. I think the problem is they're engaging with us, 
we can't quite see that they've done enough that we can offer them that junior position. So again, I'd go back to my answer of education needs to improve um, across the board, I think. And I don't always think universities are the best way to do that. I think there may be better ways, but that's a conversation for a different time. But then once, you, once you're out, if you're, you can upskill yourself, you can um, upskill via courses. And also there are many places um, that skill set do sort of uh, uh, meetings between people. At the end of courses, they usually have a grad fair where we've certainly always send people and pick people up from. But again, I think, I think the answer is different. I think, I think the answer is getting people out of university to a correct standard um, that, that we can easily employ them. Yeah, I would add to that. Um, yeah, we've seen lots of very similar things. You get things in even people who have come off master's courses and it's kind of scandalous that the universities are taking the money from people and claiming to have trained them when they're just not at anywhere near the right level. There are, we've tried to do bits and pieces in the past and then kind of base camps and bring people to connect them to studios, give them industry experience out of college or people who have just had a small amount. Um, and there are people who have been working on this for years to try and get universities to work closer in hand with studios. That's what they do in America, for example, isn't it? The, the, all the big studios in, in LA, you, are, you have direct links with people in the studios. You've got direct industry experience. Uh, of course, we should be demanding that, um, certainly in the UK and, and across the world from your educational courses, basically, there should be links to industry so that you are working with people in studios as you're learning and you come out ready for, to be employed as uh, uh, France uh, almost all animation schools are private so uh, we thought that it was an absolutely an absolute necessity to include people no matter no matter from where they come so we created our own uh, kind of school for CG animation uh, with animators that were chosen from uh, all uh, all places without any qualification and totally free for our students. And uh, we trained uh, these people. Uh, it, uh, we, we started three years ago and we trained uh, each time 30 people. And then we offered them a year uh, contract in our studio. And some of them are now in the main biggest uh, studios in France and uh, got uh, good jobs afterwards. So uh, it is our way to, to see that question. Great, okay, so we're gonna uh, have one more, well, it's two more combined into one question uh, from Becky and uh, Becky Overton and Alison Warner. So it's about communicating creatively internationally. So um, uh, any experience advice on running successful writers meetings or workshops over Zoom and how can we meet and exchange ideas with our international counterparts? Um, oh, well, again, yeah, you're doing that already, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge and it depends what you would like from your writers uh, meeting as well because writers meetings are also different. Like I went once to New York for three days to brainstorm ideas and we spent literally every day all together, all writers in one room with head writer just brainstorming ideas for three days because we wanted to come up with all the stories, like 52 episodes for the show. And sometimes you go to London and it's half a day and you're just basically listening to the creators of the show and they're explaining what they, how they see the project and they're trying to give you a better idea uh, about the characters and trying to get your... The, so it depends what, what, is, what is the result of the workshop because the reality is uh, like m most of the writers that I, I work with and uh, it feels like uh, we are people that need to go back home and think about things anyway. So it's quite tricky, like I find personally very tricky to come up with ideas on the spot. Like I need to go away, have a good think about it and then actually produce some ideas. And it's fine to have a follow-up call and or follow-up meeting and discuss them, which is great. But uh, I think actually you can make it work uh, successfully over Zoom. And uh, I participated in a couple and it's fine. It's, uh, it's uh, of course I miss uh, seeing people and actually kind of hearing them properly and kind of going for a coffee afterwards. Which, but uh, because I already work in the industry for a while, I know a lot of people and I met them before. So I already kind of adapted to their, uh, to their style of their work. And yeah, so 
yeah. I guess uh, it's possible. It's uh, maybe it means uh, I think how I would do it. I would do it in a couple of days, like one small meeting, to introduction meeting, then have a day off to think of ideas, and then the next day meet up again, discuss things. You know, like make it a bit more flexible, not like full on day. Obviously, you can't spend the whole day on Zoom <laughs> for eight hours. <laughs> Although it feels like we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um anyone got anything else to add to that on yeah the green, green? maybe it's the thing of like you mentioned having met people first i think that makes a, a lot of a difference doesn't it it's a lot easier if you have physically okay. met or only virtually met um uh yeah and and that and that goes across all kind of zoom meetings but basically doesn't it if you can meet someone physically first then you can do everything else through through skype and zoom and stuff the other is etiquette i think which again is you you're used that's the same as if you're all in the room you know, there's some people who will talk over everyone and some people will sit and listen and how does that work that's just amplified i think on zoom isn't it we've had successful kind of writer sessions on zoom as well and yeah it's about the people that you're with if you you understand that and you're allowing people time to speak and maybe collections of of people in different space i think it's probably you know yeah a, a balance of those kind of things again comes back to the community things if you can have hubs that have communities then that kind of really helps i think you can bring different groups of people together great uh, we have uh used up all the time uh, that was great so um uh, apologies if you didn't get to ask, uh, didn't get your question answered, or you, uh, if you think of something later, uh, then our panelists will be happy to take your questions directly. Um, they may even have the opportunity to read the questions that were unanswered in the box and, uh, and answer later. Um, contact details should be coming up in the chat now so um, feel free to contact everyone so that's it for this amazing two-month experiment in keeping the children's media community alive alert connected and looking out for each other during lockdown as we now get a glimpse of what comes next where is the CMC it's not in the showroom it's not in the hubs. It's not in the crucible. Or the town hall. So where is the CMC? Hello? Hello? CMC? Is this on? Hello? Hello? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Hello? Email before I do a zoom and oh, is that my hair? Oh, oh bollocks. So, yeah, so what? Scooby dooby doo. the CMC. All your favourites at the Children's Media Conference online from the 6th to the 10th of July. Register now on the CMC website. <laughs>